Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brandy Muller-Reed, and my pronouns are she and her. And I have the privilege of being your service leader this morning. As, and I'll be joined, of course, with our minister, Reverend Rosemary. We do hope you feel welcome here. So we're going to start with a few announcements. I have Gordon, Reverend Rosemary, and Marilyn. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and Gordon Ritchie. So following the service uh, this morning, we are going to be decorating the halls. I know, for the festive season. Uh, so um, it's, it's always a very fun and exciting uh, little um, event. And so um, more hands make light work. So if you're able to stay after the service to help decorate, that would be great. Uh, and I also do need some hearty souls to help to bring the Christmas trees from the mezzanine down. Um, so that one I definitely need some help with. So if you're able to assist on that, that would be great too. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marilyn Gay, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm here today, and Ruth, Ruth is walking along there. Ruth, Marriott, and I are organizing uh, Amnesty International's Right for Rights coming up on December 8th. So I wanted to give you some advance notice about that. Um, and I thought I'd read to you a statement from Amnesty International in case some of you are not really clear on what this is all about. Amnesty International is a global movement of more than 10 million people who campaign for a world where human rights are enjoyed by all. We are independent of any government, political ideology, economic interest, or religion, and are funded mainly by our membership and public donations. So once a year, there's a letter writing campaign uh, centered around December 10th, which is the United Nations International Day for Human Rights. But we always choose the closest Sunday. That will be December 8th. And writing materials will be in the foyer for you to respond to nine different cases of human uh, citizens who have who are who are prisoners of conscience these aren't just individuals because almost every one of them was and will be when freed an activist working for human rights in their own country i'm sure when you look at those profiles one of them at least will touch your heart so make a plan to stay maybe 15 minutes after church on the 8th in order to write a letter. Thousands of letters flood into the desks of presidents, dictators, kings, um, leaders in the countries involved, and it has good results. So you'll be hearing from me again next week. And I see we have a couple more, Lauren and Declan, before we get to you. Oh, I took too many papers. Oh, yeah, don't take them on. Oh, oops. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Lauren, him, her, my pronouns. I'm here to uh, tell you that we are a welcoming and uh, very joyful uh, community and that uh, your membership committee is charged with the important role of welcoming newcomers to the, to the, to the church. And this, um, the purpose that uh, I'm up here for now is to remind you of the value of wearing a name tag. I know, I know, we forget and everybody knows who I am. But if you think about it for a minute, Someone new might not know who you are. And it's, it's, it's a way to, to, uh, to greet and to welcome new people. And you're gonna say, well, you know, I've got one somewhere. But before I talk about that, let me first of all say that we really do appreciate those that do wear name tags now. And uh, some of you will say, well, gee, you know, I don't know if I have a name tag. Well, 
you know, good news. We're going to take care of that. We're going to have... <laughs> We're going to have new name tags available for you in the month of December. And uh, I, I would really like to see all of those of you who are willing to do so to really seriously consider uh, how welcoming it is to wear a name tag. Good morning. My name is Declan Kiley. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about our monthly movie nights that we have at UCE. So these are free events uh, once a month on the last Friday of every month. So this Friday, November 29th, we will be watching the movie Paris is Burning. Um, this is run kind of like a Soul Matters discussion as well. We're going to watch a movie and then discuss it as it relates to the theme this month, Repair. Um, so I do want to say that Paris is Burning, uh, I believe it is rated R for sexuality and language, but if you're curious about what Paris is Burning is, it says, this, is, this documentary focuses on drag queens living in New York City and their house culture, which provides a sense of community and support for the flamboyant and often socially stunned, shunned performers. Groups from each house compete in elaborate balls that take cues from the world of fashion, also touching on issues of racism and poverty, the film features interviews with a number of renowned drag queens, including Willie Ninja, Pepper LaBeja, and Dorian Corey. So if you're interested in that, come on out this Friday, November 29th at 6 p.m. It's a free event, and we also have some little cards in the front um, that have those details for you. Thank you. That's a perfect movie because this is um, yesterday or this week has been tra is Trans Day of Remembrance. It's a perfect m movie for for this month. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, I'm Rosemary. I'm Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. And my pronouns are she and her. I guess I should have done that first. Um, my announcement is that this Wednesday at Three Vikings, which is just around the corner on 124th Street, uh, is our a monthly you use on tap. It used to be on Mondays, but now it's going to be the last Wednesday of every month. Uh, I'll be there by 6 o'clock, and it's a time for people to visit with one another in a relaxed, um, informal setting with somebody else doing the cooking and the dishes. And just to and the purpose is to just get to know one get to know one another in a little different way. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> the Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, liberal religious, multi generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritual questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. We also gather today with gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And so, as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet your devices and yourselves so that we can all enjoy the service. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. We be begin this time with we begin with a time of contemplation and music with this prelude played I believe by Karen Mills.
Karen. Uh, we will now light our chalice, as is the tradition. You're looking at me like I missed something. No? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what do I do? Oh, I, I've signaled on Andrea to come up for me, please, at the last minute, as normal. <laughs> I'm like, hey you. Um, so, being in or being sanctuary by Joe Von Roo and Lynette Lau. Welcome to this space, this sanctuary of peace, where we come to not only create our best selves, but to also do the work of creating beloved community. We come together today as individuals, much like individual pieces of glass or pottery, that are different shapes, sizes, and colors, all of which are broken with imperfect, jagged edges, but always beautiful. While our pieces may not always fit neatly together, it is within this sanctuary, guided by our principles, that we gather together to create a beautiful mosaic. May the brokenness and beauty you find in one another create peace in this space and fill our hearts with love as we create this special time together. Thank you, Andrew. And now we're going to start with our opening hymn, number 347, Gather the Spirit. The text is behind me, and please stand as you were willing and able for number 347. some opening words for us by Atina O. Danner as we we're talking about mending our lives and repair this month. I thought this was a very appropriate piece to read. If you are feeling worn thin and riddled with holes, I hope you will take comfort in the fact that much can be mended. Mending comes in many forms, and be aware. Mending won't make a thing new. You will be the same as what makes you, you. Yourself patched up, pulled together and swiftly sewn, 
If you've got time for darning, it is work, 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 tedious as meditation, and sometimes as rewarding. Just do what you have time for. My fabric has a lot of holes. I'm grateful for the stars I can see through them, the sunlight warming my blood. I mend some, I leave some. Mend some, leave some, patching in remnants of steel wire in my own voice. You deserve. It'll be okay. Keep going, keep going, keep sewing. Truth holds tighter, and I wear the truth I've told. When places in life tear and wear thin, examine the frayed edges and the threadbare patches, and if they tear, appreciate the light coming in as you learn how best to mend. One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to be more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of all the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. For the month of November, we are supporting the Edmonton Food Bank. The Edmonton Food Bank, of course, is well known for providing food to those that are in need. The Edmonton Food Bank also runs several community programs, one of which is the Snack Program, supporting nutrition for all classes and kids. This program is utilized by 88 schools in Edmonton to ensure children are provided a variety of healthy foods for snacks, by purchasing snacks that are found on Alberta Health Services' single serving list in accordance with Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. For those in the sanctuary, you can use the envelopes found in the inside cover of the hymn book. If you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift, please indicate on the envelope your contact information so we can send you a tax receipt at your end. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. For those of you online, we encourage you to visit the Edmonton Food Bank website to make a donation. And the offering will now be received. of spirit and action. And now it's time for my little reflection. I love Christmas. I always have. I love the food. I love the lights, the pretty decorations, the hot cocoa, the carols, the food, the Christmas tree, the music, movies, family time, and yes, the food. (laughs) I grew up in a house where Christmas was a big thing. We had our Christmas traditions. And as I grew up, I carried those traditions onto my new and growing family. Of course, as, as a new family, new traditions were also started and added to. And then I met my partner, and with a blended family come their traditions, plus our new ones to be made. Y'all, there are a lot of traditions in my house. <laughs> and I love it, I truly do. And I would probably be the most upset if some of them didn't happen. But it's exhausting, too. And I'm not just talking about the day of traditions. No, I'm talking about the Christmas baking and the goodie prep that starts a month in advance. The decorating of the house beforehand. The annual great Christmas tree hunt, which aforementioned baking is then consumed. And the list goes on. 
And in the busyness of the season and the preparation, it's easy to get overwhelmed and forget exactly what Christmas is about. Getting caught up in the details and forgetting the big picture is easy. What is the big picture of Christmas? I suppose that depends on you. But for me, it's family. Spending time with those I love. But when I spend time with them, I don't want to be the stressed out version of me, the crazy, yelling and impatient mother, stressed from all the details to be finished. No, I want to be relaxed and just able to enjoy myself. I want to enjoy being with my family and all the small things that make Christmas feel magical if you pause long enough to appreciate it. This means I must be mindful of how I spend my time and what I carry around. I need to take some of that time for me to just slow down, think, relax, and breathe. And in a season, and in a season where time is a commodity, I need to be intentional in how I decompress with these small windows of time. What does that look like to me? How do I take time to slow down my racing brain and re-energize? Sometimes this means making my 30-minute morning commute in dead silence. Sometimes it means the commute has the radio cranked to that old rock station while I karaoke the H-E double hockey sticks out of it. <laughs> Sometimes it means I sit quietly with myself, sometimes I cook, sometimes I read. It's what brings me peace in the eye of the storm. Whatever a few precious minutes can give me to restore my soul and mend my whirling mind that is being obliterated with to-do lists. It makes the craziness of the season a little easier. But perhaps more importantly, as I've gotten older, I've also learned to release that need for perfection to loosen my control on the details that don't actually make Christmas perfect, to reflect on what this time of year actually means or what I want it to mean and let the rest go. There is always another day and another one after that to get things done, and sometimes it may be that it never gets done, and that's okay. Acknowledging and accepting this is half of my battle to easing my stress. The, this perspective of prioritizing my mind over my to-do list has made the season more enjoyable. <clears throat> a few years back, I was on a retreat where this poem was given to us. It struck a chord with me then, and while it is more a poem about the big picture of life, as we enter these times of endless to-do and chaos, it strikes a chord once more. It serves as a reminder that in this season, in this life, things may not get done, and that is okay. That is the process. For me, it is a good reminder. The poem is by Richard S. Gilbert, titled, Life is Always Unfinished Business. In the midst of the whirling day, in the hectic rush of doing, in the frantic pace of life, pause here for a moment. Catch your breath, relax your body, loosen your grip on life. Consider that our lives are always unfinished business. Imagine that picture of our being is never complete. Allow your life to be a work in progress. Do not hurry to mold the masterpiece. Do not rush to finish the picture. Do not be impatient to complete the drawing. From beckoning birth to dawning death, we are in the process. And always there is more to be done. Do not let the incompleteness weigh on your spirit. Do not despair that imperfection marks your every day. Do not fear that we are still in the making. Let us instead be grateful that the world is still to be created. Let us give thanks that we can be more than we are. Let us celebrate the power of incomplete, for life is always unfinished business. In the craziness of the season, I hope you also take time for yourself to take pause, breathe deep, meditate, take a minute to let go, restore yourself, Put less emphasis on the details and see the big picture in this lovely, crazy, half-done life. And now we will have our second hymn, number 1058, May Your Life Be a Song. It's actually the, 1059. Oh, sorry, 1059. For those online that are here, the text is behind me. And please rise in body and spirit as we sing together 1059. And we're going to sing it through twice.
how many knew that hymn really well? How many have never sung that hymn before? How many have maybe sung it? Okay, it is a round, so we'll get there. It's a lovely thing, isn't it? So the reading this morning is an excerpt from Unplug the Christmas Machine, a complete guide to putting love and joy back into the season. And one of the things I love about the service leader um, reflection is um, they often say what I wish I'd said, (laughs) but like right on, just absolutely right on. So um, we were thinking the same way today. Yeah. So this is from the Unplug the Christmas Tree. No, machine. (laughs) Unplug the Christmas machine. (sighs) It's going to be a long day. In the many years we've spent talking to people about Christmas, they used to put on these workshops, Unplug the Christmas Machine workshop. We've cataloged a lot of common problems people have during the holiday season. Many people feel pressured by all the work involved in orchestrating the family celebration. Many people are worried about holiday bills. Some people are worried about how to survive Christmas after a recent loss, such as a divorce, a death in the family, or a layoff from a job. Others are troubled by the fact that they are childless or single or estranged from their families and wonder how they can piece together a memorable celebration. But the one concern that unites virtually all the people we've talked to is a yearning for a simpler, less commercial, more more soul-satisfying celebration. There is a universal wish to end the year with a festival of Renewal that rekindles our faith, brings us closer to the people we care about, and brings light and laughter to the dark days of winter. We want to ward off the commercial excesses of the season and create an authentic, joyful celebration in tune with our unique needs and desires. It's no wonder that so many people feel disappointed by Christmas, It's not that they don't like the holiday, it's that they don't like what's happened to it. People tell us that Christmas has become increasingly impersonal, frenetic, costly, and empty of meaning. As we... I fooled them up there. Oh, that'll make a difference. I'm sure I'd unmuted. As we approach December and all the... So this was the service description for um, this service. I'm going to move up here. As we approach December and all the extra demands of our time, let's gather together to think about what this time of year means to us. Please join Reverend Rosemary, it says in the newsletter, which you did. Thank you. Please join Reverend Rosemary to explore some ways to prioritize, set boundaries, and make it through to 2025 in great shape. So how many here love the holiday season? Yeah, I do too. Um, So what do you love about it? You can call it out, I'll repeat it. So maybe like one or two word answers. It's shiny, lights, the food. Somebody else that had their hand up? Eggnog. Music. Music. David. The food, the food, and the food. Okay. Yeah. Christmas Carol. Oh, the Dickens one. Yeah. Alistair Sim. (laughs) The one with Alistair Sim. So watching Christmas films... Um, especially the black and white one with Alistair Sim. (laughs) Ritual. Sparkles and snow. When I lived in Chilliwack, I moved from Saskatchewan uh, when I was 10 to Chilliwack, B.C. And we had a rainy, gray Christmas. And I was devastated. There was 
no snow in Chilliwack, but there was a ton of rain. My dad said, well, at least you don't have to shovel it. Well, I'm like, so how many here might be dreading the upcoming month and uh, wish that we were already done with it? How many here might be dreading it? Be honest, even just a little bit. Works retail. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So people working retail. So my next question is, what are what are your concerns? So people are saying that it's it's working retail. They that it's uh, super super busy. And then maybe if you have a business and you're relying on that, then it just dies off in January and you don't have any income. So you've got to be pretty careful in December. I guess that's why they call it Black Friday, because apparently this is the week when things... Oops. Um, apparently this is the week where things turn the corner and the business starts to make money. I'm, I'm one that used to dread the holiday season, and now... I kind of mostly look forward to it, um, mostly because I don't have a present buying list the, as long as both of my arms put together. As a lot of you knew, know, some, I was a foster parent, and sometimes I'd have seven kids in the house, plus all the, my, um, my partner's aunts. They, apparently, all the aunties had to have a present, even though they didn't really need it. And then, and then there was all of, there was just so many things to do and I dreaded it. I usually stayed up all night Christmas Eve wrapping gifts and you can imagine how many gifts when there's five, six kids in the house. So here are the ten hidden gift-giving rules that I thought I must obey. And maybe you think you have to obey these as well. Give a gift to everyone you expect one from. If someone gives you a gift unexpectedly, reciprocate that year. And then, you know, that some, some people have like pre-wrapped gifts and the generic ones like chocolates wrapped or napkins or candles or something. So you can just give them one right away. Oh, I have one for you too. When you add a name to your gift list, give that person a gift every year forever thereafter. The amount of money you spend on a gift determines how much you care about the recipient. How many of us believe that? I used to believe that. No? Okay. Not anymore. I used to believe that. Gifts exchanged between adults should be roughly equal in value. The presents you give someone should be fairly consistent in value over the years. So if you have a really close friend, you get them a really nice present, you have to give them a really nice present for every year thereafter until you both are gone. If you give a, pers a gift to a person in one category, for example, a co-worker or a neighbor, give a gift to everyone in that category, and those gifts should be similar in value. Women should get, <laughs> this is an old book, so I'm sorry about the gender stuff. It was uh, published in 1990. It's pretty old. Women should give gifts to their close women friends. Men should not give gifts to their male friends unless those gifts are alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Whenever the above rules cause you any difficulty, remedy the situation by buying more gifts. Well, I don't think that this is a real list. I think it's uh, quite tongue-in-cheek, but I think I almost had you until I got to number 10. These rules are ridiculous, and yet so many of them I used to try to obey for a lot of my life. When my kids were little and my parents were still having Christmas with us, I tried valiantly and never really measured up. I actually did subscribe to many of those rules. In fact, I used to, if <laughs> one Christmas, I think it was the first Christmas that my, my husband and I spent, my former spouse and I spent together, and he got me a gift that I thought um, showed me that he didn't really care about me, because it was not up to snuff. It was, it was a lovely silk shirt, but it was not enough. He must not love me, I thought. 
This is ludicrous thinking. December brings with it so many pressures, many of them delightful, but extra demands on our time nonetheless. Concerts, hosting, shopping, baking, decorating. And if you're able, please stay after and decorate. <laughs> Getting a tree up, so many extra things. And so when I had kids at home, I found it excessively overwhelming and entirely, entirely overwhelming and at times very worrisome because as a single mom, I sometimes didn't have the resources to buy all the things. We're going to go into small groups in a few moments and there will be two opportunities to do that. So just stay in your small groups and you're going to be chatting for a couple of minutes. I'm going to offer you some questions. And for those of you online, you can type things into the chat or have a conversation together or both. So for you online, when someone types something into the chat, make a comment after it and get a conversation going. And that can be really fun. And so um, I hope that you're able to do that. So you've got a few minutes. But like I say, after those couple, two or three minutes, everybody's got about a minute and a half to share. And then we're going to stop, and then we're going to share again. Okay. So what's the question? I want you to talk about, with other people, the things that you love about Christmas and why. Ready, set. Ah, knee groups. Knee groups, so two or three at the most together. So just turn to your neighbor, put your chairs towards one another. We know what you love about Christmas. Actually, I like... I can have your attention. Please feel free to switch into the next question, which is, what would you prefer to not have to, not have to do? over this holiday season, what would you prefer to not do or have happen this holiday season? Did everyone get a chance to speak? Yes? Yeah. It's never enough time, and I, and I recognize that. It's like, oh, do we have to talk to one another? And then you guys start talking to one another, and I can't make you be quiet. <laughs> so, you love it so much, so it happens. So, I've ho I hope you've heard some good and fun things and some not fun things. I hope you've learned about what other people like and what other people don't like. And maybe there's, you, there's some similarities and maybe there's some differences. So for the things you don't like or find, or find overwhelming, what do you think you could do differently this year? Did you guys get to that at all? What, what could you do differently this year if you're, so that you're not feeling so overwhelmed? So how will you feel if your decision to not overwork or overspend upsets someone? How can you create the season that you want to have? 
What are the things you can let go of to make room for the things you love about this time of year? I've personally let go of a lot of gift buying, but then I don't have little kids in the houses, so it's easy for me to say. And, uh, but, of course, I still buy gifts for my grandchildren, probably too many. And sometimes, um, and I also give something experiential to my adult children, so concert tickets or um, whatever, lessons for something or that kind of thing. I've made room for the things that I love about Christmas, playing the piano, playing duets, Christmas duets with friends and family. I love the twinkly lights. I love entertaining. I love, I love going to people's houses during this time, too. <laughs> Did I mention the music? Visiting with people I care about, going to concerts and hearing music. I've let go of the ex expectation that I can do it all. And I've begun to enjoy the holiday season so much more. I do some baking, a little bit of baking. I make the things that I like to make now, like the whipped shortbread. I pipe it out and put, it's so cute and so delicious. So I hope this exercise has been helpful. And I know that there are always going to be the half do's, especially when there are children involved. And may you have the strength to get through this month with grace. May you remember that this season isn't just about commercialism but also about sharing our light as we await the return of the sun. I'd like to invite you into a short time of meditation. To help with that, I invite you, always by invitation, never demand, to place your feet on the floor and take a couple of deep <sighs> cleansing breaths. Allow the pull of the gravity on the earth to sink you into your chair. Find comfort in knowing you do not have to hold yourself. You don't have to keep it together in this moment. You may rest. You may rest here. And I'm going to read a little meditation poem or prose by Sean, Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. Reverend Sean is an ordained and fellowshiped and settled trans man that lives in the United States. I'm not sure where he's serving right now. And I chose one of his works because it is Trans, Trans Day of Remembrance, the other day. Sean's words. I'm going to read them twice with a bit of silence in between. Today has been a day, like all days, it seems, in which I let people down and did not love as fully as I always hoped. And today I have been sad because always there are unexpected and unpredictable consequences of what I do and do not know. And yet, the taste of this perfectly ripe pear on my tongue reminds me of heaven and of gifts beyond measure like sweetness and sunset and again tomorrow. Today, today has been a day, like all days it seems, in which I let people down. And I did not love as fully as I always hope. 
And today I have been sad because always there are unexpected and unpredictable consequences of what I do and do not know. And yet, the taste of this perfectly ripe pear on my tongue reminds me of heaven and of gifts beyond measure, like sweetness and sunset and again tomorrow. Let us enter into another moment of silence after which Karen will bring us out with our meditation hymn, Meditation on Breathing. Before we start singing, I want to just walk you through this hymn. It's a little bit different if you've never done it before. Um, it has three parts to it. And so there's what's called a drone part. But that's really the strength and the foundation. Uh, and it's a look for lower voices or, if you like, higher voices an octave higher. Um, there's a middle section that's actually the melody. And then there's a higher section that's just adding an extra thought to the meditation and so you're welcome to choose a part stick with it through the whole thing if you like or go back and forth between the three parts uh, this piece was written by Sarah Dan Jones who is a southern US uh, composer and musician and she wrote it right after 9-11 because she wanted something that anybody no matter what their belief or their philosophies could center with and collect as a community with. And so this is the meditation on breathing that she wrote. So I'm going to start. Anybody with the lower voices or anyone who wants to do the drone part, this is your part. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe For the middle part, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out. When I breathe out, 
Thank you, Karen. We've come to that time in our service when we light candles of joy and concern. There are two stations set up. If you choose to light a candle of joy or concern in silence, I invite you to use this station to my right, your left, this station. This station has a microphone attached to it and you are invited to light a candle in the usual way and then come to the microphone and say your name and pronouns and then speak to the candle that you have lit. So we do this, we do spoken candles once in a while and, and um, it's such a lovely way to learn about what's going on in each other's life. It helps build community, of course. Um, as you light your candles, please, if to help, to help me to help you remember to face the cameras so that the people online aren't just seeing your back. And also as you speak to your joy or concern, to keep it personal and brief. Thank you. I invite you to light candles of joy or concern at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of shy people this morning. And that's okay. Sorry if that felt sounded like a not uh, not okay thing to be. Go ahead. Um, I introduced myself originally, Marilyn Gay, she, her. Um, again, in December, I'm vastly overcommitted, but some of my commitments pertain to this church and how much I love serving the people that I see around me today. Um, very well, I already spoke about Amnesty International Right for Rights. So that's coming up, but also, um, Blue Christmas seems to hit the right note for this service because there are some of us who feel overcommitted, stressed, or distressed in some way. And Blue Christmas will be on the 17th. Reverend Rosemary will provide some spiritual um, uh, support. And I'm going to be working, hopefully, with a bunch of volunteers to put out a comfort food meal. Um, so this is my personal commitment to the church, is to do events from time to time, and uh, this is very meaningful to me. All the while, with fingers crossed, because we are expecting the imminent birth of our second great-grandchild this week. Hi, I'm Kathy. I um, haven't been to church in a long time. I've been experiencing a few challenges of the last few months, which seem to really deplete my energy. But it's always nice to come here. I love coming here. Um, I feel energized again, thank goodness. Um, and for those of you who are in retail, I just came up with a little mantra the other day because I work at the Superstore in Calgary Trail, and we get pretty busy sometimes. And my mantra it seems to be, always be there for people, be as helpful as you can, and be very specific about telling people what products are where and where they need to go. Because a lot of customers will come into the store, they're overwhelmed, they don't know where they need to go, they don't necessarily look at the signs above the aisles, but that's what we're all there for. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, 
Art Breyer here, and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, this past week my uh, brother-in-law, Helmut Gatskip, died in uh, Leduc. I'm Tony Wong, he, him. I want to acknowledge, not yesterday, but Saturday, a week ago, Reverend Rosemary was the celebrant for my wife's celebration of life. She did a fabulous job. I was so happy with her message. It was just totally fantastic. You've got a superstar as leader of this congregation. as brandy lights a last candle of joy or concern. Let us hold all these things in our hearts that we have heard, that we know are true, that we need support with. And sometimes it's really important to ask for support when we need it. And sometimes that's how we get through some of the difficult times. May it be so. We come to the end of our service as we sing, let the Spirit do what the Spirit says. What's it called? When the Spirit says do, you got to do. But you don't have to do too much.
Huzzah. <laughs> oh, my mic was on. Oh, dear. <laughs> thank you to everybody. That was lovely. And thank you to everybody who made this service today possible, including Andrea, who I'm going to call up again to extinguish our flame. We have a blessing for presence by John O'Donohue. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame and anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of soul. May you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. I would like to add my thanks to Brandy's. Thank you, everyone, for being here in person and online. We can't do it without you. You are the most important part of the service. We, uh, there's a lot of work, hard work, that goes into the service every week, and your participation is so, so desperate, not desperately, but dearly loved. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the music and the tech and the everything. And I leave you with this, these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things break, as you know, and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go and love intentionally. And love extravagantly, and above all, love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the love and the light that is within you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And we will sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. And if you haven't been here before, we make an awkward circle and hold hands. <laughs> <laughs>